Hello, uh, this is a recording on the module VIN 3702. Um, this recording is the second part of the revision. And um, in this recording, I'm going to take you through uh, section B, the essay type questions of the May, June 2019 paper. Uh, as previously uh, mentioned, you can go through the multiple choice section of the paper along with the memo that I'm supplying with this class. And then you can compare your answers. Remember the, the multiple choice questions are very similar to, to what you get asked in assignments. So you can also use those for practice. So I'm going to continue by taking you through section B of the May, June 2019 paper. In the previous recording, I took you through the October, November 2019 paper. Okay. So question one in section B says, uh, the Calgary group of companies is attempting to establish a working capital policy. We are told fixed assets are 600,000 and the company plans to maintain a 50% debt to total assets ratio. Uh, the interest rate is 10% on all debt. And we have three alternative current asset policies, which is just the same as three alternative working capital policies. They have an aggressive policy in which there's 40% um, current assets on projected sales. The moderate policy is 50% current assets on projected sales and the conservative policy is 60% current assets on projected sales. Uh, the company expects to earn 15% interest, 15% before interest and taxes on sales. So in other words, the operating profit margin, they expect an operating profit margin of 15%. They expect to earn 15% before interest and taxes on sales and their tax rate is 30%. Then we are asked to determine the company's expected return on equity under each of the three alternative working capital policies above. We are given a hint here, use the information provided above to complete the tables provided below where indicated. Then determine the expected return on equity for each of these alternative working capital policies. Use the space provided below for your preliminary calculations. So you have to fill in this template uh, with respect to each of the working capital policies we have been told with respect to current assets, where it's 40% on sales, 50% on sales, 60% on sales for aggressive, moderate, and conservative. So, <clears throat> Uh, firstly, we calculate the percentages invested in current assets under each of the working capital policies. So under the aggressive policy, it will simply be 40% of sales, giving us 1.2 million. Under the moderate policy, it will be 50% of sales, giving us 1.5 million. And under the conservative policy, it will be 60% of sales, giving us 1.8 million, right? And then we are told our fixed assets are 600,000. Uh, the fixed assets are going to remain the same. Nothing is going to happen here. And then if we add the current assets and fixed assets, we get our total assets of 1.8, 2.1, and 2.4 million. And then since our total assets are 1.8 million, it follows that the total equity and liabilities will be 1.8 million. And since our total assets here are 2.1 million, it follows that our total equity and liabilities here will be 2.1 million. 2.4 total assets means total equity and liabilities is 2.4. And then we've been told that the company wishes to maintain a 50% debt to total assets ratio. The company wishes to maintain a 50% debt to total assets ratio. So we divide our total assets by two 
because his debt is going to be half of total assets, debt half of total assets, and debt half of total assets, which means um, 50% of our total assets is debt, that's the debt ratio. And then we know that total equity and liabilities minus debt gives us equity. So the balance will be equity. We'll say total equity and liabilities minus debt giving us equity. So this 900,000, 1,051.24 for equity, it's simply our total equity and liabilities minus the debt, and then we get those amounts. So that's how you were supposed to complete this table. So debt is simply 50% of total assets. <coughs> Right, and then the, the next part of the question, you were given another table. Uh, this table now was showing the alternative income statement for Calgary Group under each of the working capital policies, under the aggressive working capital policy, moderate and conservative. So we need to fill this table in, right? So we've been given our sales. We've been told that our sales are 3 million. So these will be our sales, right? And then our earnings before interest and tax, we've been told that 15% of sales. So we simply find 15% of 3 million, we get 450,000. And then our interest expense, uh, the interest expense is going to be based on the debt that we have right here. It's going to be based on the debt. And we've been told that the interest is 10% on debt. We've been told, sorry, um, we've been told here yeah, the interest rate is 10% on debt. So that means under the aggressive policy, we say 10% of 900,000. 10% uh, of 900,000 give us the interest expense of 90. Under the moderate policy, 10% of 1,050,000 to give us 105,000. And under the conservative policy, 10% of 1.2 million to give us 120,000. So these are the interest expenses that we have. In any question you're doing, whenever you get to interest expense and you can't find it anyway, just try to remember where you, you dealt with debt before in the question. So we then subtract and we get our earnings before tax of 360, 345, and 330,000. We subtract tax at 30%, 30% of 360, 30% of 345, 30% of 330. We get these tax expenses. We subtract those from earnings before tax, giving us net income of 252, 241, 500, and 231,000. So this is our net income. And then lastly, we can get our return on equity. Our return on equity is given by our net income divided by uh, total equity. Our return on equity is given by this net income divided by total equity, owner's equity. But always be sure to check first to see if there are any preference dividends. If you do have preference dividends, you need to first subtract them. Uh, before you calculate return on equity. So sometimes they are preference dividends. If there are no preference dividends, we just take our net income over total equity, total equity, which we obtained before right here. So we just take our net income divided by total equity to give us our return on equity. But if there were preference share dividends, please remember you would have to subtract them from net income. So under the aggressive policy, we get a return on equity of 28%. Under the moderate policy, return on equity of 23%. Under the conservative policy, return on equity of 19.3%. Okay. <clears throat> and then lastly, you are asked, what would you recommend? What would be your recommended? Based on your findings in 1.1 above, which working capital policy would you recommend and why? Right. So um, I said I would recommend the aggressive working capital policy. Uh, this is because the policy will result in the highest return on equity, which means this policy will be the most profitable. 
So here, I advise that we would pick the aggressive policy because of the highest return on equity, meaning that policy would be the most profitable. However, this policy will also be the riskiest policy due to the level, due to the low level of um, current assets. It's only 40% on sales. Current assets are only 40% on sales. So it will pose the highest risk of technical insolvency. Remember, uh, <clears throat> there's a trade-off between risk and profit. When your profit goes up, it means that your risk also goes up. And when your profit goes down, it means your risk of technical insolvency also goes down. So there's an inverse relationship there. So even if the company does choose to implement the aggressive working capital policy, they are going to be offsetting some, uh, <clears throat> some risk. They'll be taking on more risk with that policy because they'll have a lower number of current assets. Okay. And then lastly, there was question number two. Uh, question number two was a question on the cash budget. Uh, we were given a company here, which was forecasting its short-term financing needs, and it requires assistance in determining these needs and the possible costs of financing. Uh, the following information has been passed on to you. Um, the bookkeeper extracted an aging report in the system and determined that 40% of sales were paid in the same month that the sales were made and the remainder was paid one month later. And all sales are on credit. This is important. The company has access to a 1 million rand revolving credit facility at a cost of 12% per year, assuming 365 days per year. No administrative fees are applicable. All purchases and other expenses are paid in cash. So we're given the sales from March, April, and May, the expected sales for June, July, and August. Additionally, purchases amount to 50% of sales and other costs amount to 200,000 rand per month, but exclude a depreciation expense of 5,000 rand per month. Draw up a cash budget for this company for June, July, and August and determine how much requisite short-term financing by the way of the revolving credit facility will cost in rent terms if utilized, use the space below for your calculation. Now with the cash budget, um, the first thing you should always do is to create your debtors collection schedule. Uh, other students put the debtors collection schedule straight on the cash budget, uh, that's also fine. Uh, but I prefer that you create your debtors collection schedule separately by itself and then you just put the final result into your cash budget. You will receive the same marks. It's just easier this way to actually allot the credit sales co collect co correctly to the months in which um, they, are, they are collected. Okay. So with the debtors collection schedule, you're just trying to show when your credit sales are collected. So since we are budgeting for June, July, and August, we put June, July, and August um, with columns, as I did right here. And then we highlight all the months we've been given. We've been given information on March, April, May, June, July, August. So we then put all the months uh, this side on the vertical side. And then we, we write down all our credit sales. So we've been told uh, all these amounts, this 500, 600, 400, 300, 400, 800, all those amounts are credit sales. All the sales were in credit, uh, were on credit. So we then put the credit sales associated with all our months, just the credit sales only. We put all the credit sales amounts associated right here. So it's 500, those are the credit sales for March, 600 for April, 400 for May, 300 for June, July and August and so forth. And then now we, we now allot uh, these amounts to show when uh, they are collected. And the way we do this, we say how many, so our credit collection policy uh, is based on, it's based on two months right? It's actually based on one month. 
um, if there's a credit sale, forty percent of that credit sale is collected in the same month, and then the remainder, which is sixty percent, is collected one month later. So whenever there's a credit sale, forty percent of that credit sale is collected in the same month, and then the remainder, which is sixty percent, is collected one month later, and all the sales are on credit, right? So we'll start here with March, okay? So March to June. How many months are between uh, March to June? We've got March to April, April to May, May to June. So it's three months between March to June, right? March to April, April to May, and then May to June. So it's three months. But our credit collection policy just goes up to one month after the month of sale. So it means nothing is collected here. Okay, March to April, April to May, May to June, that's three months. March to July, that's four months. March to August, that's five months. <coughs> so nothing is collected. So of this 500,000 in credit sales, none of it is collected in June, none of it is collected in July, none of it is collected in August. Of this 600,000 in April, uh, from April to June, it's April to May, May to June, that's two months, but our policy just goes up to one month. So nothing is collected two months after, nothing three months after, nothing four months after. We move to from May to June. May to June, it's one month, and we know that 60% of our credit sale is collected one month after the month of sale. So it means 60% of this 400,000 is collected in, in June. 60% of this 400,000 is collected in June. So we say 400,000 times 60% and we get 240,000, okay? Because from May to June, it's one month. And our credit policy says 40% is collected in the same month and then the remainder, which is 60%, is collected one month after. And then from June to June, June to June is the same month of sale. We know that 40% is 40% of our credit sales are collected in the same month of sale. June to July is one month after. We know 60% of our credit sales is collected one month after, giving us 180. July to July, that's the same month of sale. We know 40% of our credit sales is collected in the same month of sale, giving us 160. July to August, that's one month after. We know that 60% of our credit sale is collected one month after, giving us 240. Lastly, August to August, that's the, the month of sale, the same month, and we know that 40% is collected in the same month, giving us 40% of 800, giving us 320. <clears throat> and then we can get our total collections in each month. We simply add the the amounts allotted to each month. So the total collections for June will be 40 plus 120,000, giving us 360,000. The total collected for July will be 180 plus 160, giving us 340,000. And the total collected for August will be 240 plus 320, giving us 560. So that gives us uh, the debtors collection schedule. So you might be asked to calculate the debtors collection schedule only. So this is what we mean by the debtors collection schedule. And then next, um, and finally, we now get our cash budget. So with our cash budget, we put the months we are budgeting for right on top. We're budgeting for June, July, and August. And then uh, we'll start with our cash sales. So we've been told all our sales were on credit. So our cash sales will be zero for June, July, and August because we were told that all sales were on credit. But when we're doing our cash budget, we always start with cash sales. If there were any, we would put them. And then next, we put the collections from credit sales. For the collections from credit sales, we just take these totals that we got uh, from each of these months that we created the debtors collection schedule for. So for June, we take that 360 total for July 340. 
and for August, we take 560. And then always make sure to check your, your question to see if there are other cash receipts. Sometimes you might find that the company is receiving rental income or some other income. So always check to make sure that there's no other income that the company is receiving. And from what I can see here, yeah, there's no other income. So you'll notice that under um, other cash receipts, uh, it's just dash. But always check, sometimes the company will be receiving rental income or investment income. And then to get the total cash receipts, we add the cash sales, collection from credit sales and other cash receipts and we get 360. For July, we add the cash sales, collection from credit sales, other cash receipts, we get 340. For August, cash sales, collection from credit sales, other cash receipts, we get 560. So we add, and then we get the total cash receipts. And then we were told that all purchases were on cash, all purchases were on cash and amount to 50% of sales. We were told that uh, purchases, all purchases and other expenses are paid in cash and we are told purchases amount to 50% of sales. So we simply, uh, for June, July and August, we simply say 50% of the sales in, in June and we get our cash purchases. 50% of the sales in July, we get our cash purchases for July and for August, we get 400. Uh, sometimes you might also have some payments on credit purchases happening some months after you purchased the goods you have. So you would need to put the payments on credit purchases. For example, you might buy goods in May and then pay for them in June. So we, it's possible for us to also create a creditor's payment schedule to show how we pay our creditors in each future month. So if you had credit purchases, you would also have to create uh, a creditor's payment schedule. It's never come before in the exam, but it's something that can be asked. Usually for FIN 3702, uh, the payments on credit purchases is always zero. They always assume that you're your purchases are cash purchases, but be prepared to maybe create a creditor's uh, payment schedule to show how you pay your creditors maybe in different months after your patients. Our other costs are 200,000. We've been told that uh, they are all in cash. You'll notice I didn't in include depreciation. Remember depreciation is an uncash expense we never include depreciation in a cash budget. They did give us depreciation, but we, we don't include depreciation in a cash budget. So we just put out the costs. And then we get our total expenses. Our total expenses are uh, the cash purchases plus the payments on credit purchases plus the other costs giving us 350, 200 plus 200 giving us 400, 400 plus 200 giving us 600. And then we get our net cash flow. Our net cash flow is total cash receipts. I've put an A there to represent total cash receipts. Minus total expenses. I've put a B there to represent total expenses. That gives us our net cash flow. So we say 360 minus 350, we get 10,000. 340 minus 400, we get minus 60. 560 minus 600, we get minus 40. So the brackets mean that it's a negative. We then add the beginning cash balance. So we start with no cash balance. They haven't said anything about us having a cash balance at the end of May, but you should always just read your question carefully to see if there's a beginning cash balance for June, which would be an ending cash balance for May. We don't have that. So this is zero. We take our net cash flow at the beginning cash balance. We get 10,000, which is our ending cash balance. What we end with here is what we begin with in July. What we end with in June, we begin with in July, which is 10,000, right? And then we say the net cash flow plus 10 minus 60 plus 10,000, we get minus 50. So we end with minus 50 in July. We start with that in August. 
minus 40 minus 50, we get minus 90. So it means our ending cash balance in August will be minus 90. That's budgeted. And then we subtract the minimum cash balance. Sometimes the company want to keep a minimum cash balance of a certain amount. Yeah, there was no minimum cash balance, so it's minus zero, but sometimes the company will have a minimum cash balance. When you subtract the minimum cash balance, if you get a positive answer, 10,000 minus zero, if you get a positive answer, we say that's excess cash. That's excess cash the company has that they can invest in marketable securities. But if we take the ending cash balance and subtract the minimum cash balance and we get a negative answer, like negative 50 year, negative 90 year, it means the company requires money. So that's required total financing. So from the time we are beginning to budget, which is June, up until July, the company will require total financing of 50,000. And from June up until August, the company will require total financing of 90,000. So it will be 50,000 for for July plus 40,000 for August, meaning the total required is 90,000 for the two months. See, this is not just required financing, it's required total financing. It's telling you how much finance you require in total in that interval. So this is our cash budget. Make sure you know it. It can be asked in a different format as you saw in October and November 2019. So you really have to understand the different formats, especially the one I just showed you. And then finally, let's find the required financing and the cost. So um, because we've been told there's a revolving credit agreement and they also want us to determine how much requisite short-term financing by the way of the revolving credit facility will cost in rent terms if it is utilized. So the short-term financing the company will need will be 50,000 rand in July and 40,000 rand in August. The reason I'm saying the company will need um, 50,000 rand in July okay, is that um, in July, the company will have a net cash flow of negative 60,000 but they'll start with 10,000. It means they are going to need 50,000 to be able to meet the 60,000 rent need, okay? And then um, in August, uh, the company is going to have a net cash flow of minus 40. So the company is going to need 40,000. This 50 year that we put here, it's just a negative balance from the previous month, which will be met with the revolving credit agreement. So 50 plus 40 is giving us minus 90. This minus 90 is showing the total finance needed for both months, for both July and August. But if we are just looking at July by itself, we need 50,000. And if we're looking at August by itself, we need 40,000. And then on top of the 40,000 for August, we are adding the 50,000 for July. That's how we get 90, okay? So <clears throat> the short-term financing the company will need will be 50,000 rand in July and 40,000 rand in August. Uh, this gives a total of 90,000 rand, which we assume is paid back after one year. We assume it's a one-year revolving credit agreement we assume it's paid back after one year under the revolving credit ag agreement. Therefore, the cost of financing on the revolving credit agreement will be 15% times 90,000, which is 13,500. Okay. So, yeah. So that brings us an end to this question. The way they ask this revolving credit facility, they don't really stipulate uh, how long the facility is for. So in this case, I'm working under the assumption that whatever money they borrow, they pay back after one year. And we know that if we've been given an interest rate and it's a one year loan, it's just the interest rate times the amount borrowed. Okay. So thank you for listening. Uh, that brings us um, 
to an end on the second part of the revision for FIN 3702. Uh, please go through this, also work through the multiple choice questions. Um, if you have any questions or queries with regards to what I covered in this revision session or anything else you want to ask with regards to this paper or the module, please feel free to let me know. As usual, I, I might not always be able to get back to you promptly due to business and other commitments, but I'll try to get back to you as soon as I can. Thank you once again.